Here we go. Lift off. Ryan Olke, it's good to see you, man. Good to see you, buddy. It has been a while since we've done one of these. It has been seriously a long time. I think we took like the entirety of last year off, actually. I was looking, yeah. And I think the last one that was in my calendar was October of 2022. Wow. Yeah, so, so we, we're overdue for this. We're way overdue. Well, yeah. I missed you, man. I mean, I only miss you so much because we talk, you know, yeah, all we the talk. time, every other day or so. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's true. And our conversations and stuff, are similar to what we have here on the actual show. But it is nice to be doing this again uh, and reconnecting with the audience. Uh, Absolutely. And, and starting the conversations up again. Yeah. No, and it's totally true. Like, you know, when people watch this show when they watch inhabit you know the funny thing about it is like this is just us i mean this is this is mm -hmm. sort of like how we hang out like when we're playing yep. halo <laughs> we have we have the same conversations yeah and i like that a lot i mean it's kind of funny obviously it's informal and this is how you and i roll but i feel like hopefully it's an embodiment of what we're trying to share in terms of our exploration of integral and all these different facets of like yeah this is life right so yep. how do we talk about it in this just really open down to earth way? Yeah. Yep. So I yeah, I totally it. agree. No, it's, it's well put. And, you know, I, I like that too, that we're not, you know, we'll bring in some theoretical, absolutely, you know, sort of components of what we're talking about. Yes. We're capable of doing that. Yeah. But the point of the show is, as you say, to really sort of step into integral from the inside out Yes. and really express sort of in a personal way, you know, yeah. In a, in a personal way, exactly. Our own sort of unique inhabiting of these yeah. ideas. Yep. And to the extent that that can be useful for our audience, either for, you know, people yes. who are sort of coming in for the first time and yeah. really tasting these waters for the first time, or for the people who've been here for a while. And, you know, that's one of the most extraordinary things that I found, Ryan, is that every individual sort of in this larger integral project has this sort of very unique enactment of these ideas simply because the ideas themselves are are so big and there's so many different yeah. ways of relating to them and relating them to our lives and to the world that you just get all of these different sort of flavors personal yeah. flavors of integral and i love that i love sort of that that field effect and seeing sort of mm. the, the diversity of how people step into yeah i love that's well put. And so what love are we that. inhabiting today man I, I think we started off with a juicy but very <clears throat> open topic for us um yep. what are we inhabiting we're inhabiting your awakening our awakening i we it awakening up <laughs> yeah we should let our audience know that you actually just released a major new integral awakening integral dharma web course on integrallife.com and we've gotten such awesome feedback for that ryan really really well job thank you yeah and i want to say to the folks listening that i think that course and how i approached it really did come out of my experience with you court here in the satin habit show and the conversations and the comments of uh, and everybody participating here i wanted to create a course that was a practical support for what we discuss here. So it was yeah. very in, in the spirit of the show. So I'm, I'm just super happy to finally put it out there. And also to have you know the live uh, practice group was something that I kind of merged later that I didn't originally think about, but we've been doing a live practice group and yeah, I have another one coming up here. So that's, it's all in this spirit of inhabiting, just as you put earlier, yeah. yeah. So I had happy that we're gonna explore what it means to awaken integrally. That is the big question. Yeah. Right. What yeah. is that? That's right. Because awakening is obviously a capacity that human beings have had ever since we, you know, walked upright for the first time. Mm. I mean, I would argue that many animals, I think, probably have something like awakening experience or at least some of the, yeah. you know, the more complex nervous systems. You know, yeah. I think that, that this thing that we're calling awakening is truly a universal quality. And that actually is what makes mm. it so sort of difficult to talk about mm. because, you know, it's another one of these where the actual experience of awakening, I, in my experience anyway, has been one of seamlessness where the seams literally kind of disappear. And, and by seams, I mean yeah. sort of the divisions, all of these various polarities that we find ourselves in, yeah. in this world. You know, yeah. it's a collapse of the interior and the exterior. Yeah. It's the collapse of the relative and the absolute, mm -hmm. of form and of emptiness. It's the collapse of parts and wholes and individuals and collectives. And, you know, there's this sort of realization that, you know, can be sudden, 
but can also sort of be, you know, cumulative mm-hmm. to a certain degree, where we begin to see through, I think, a lot of the notions of separation. Yeah. Where we begin to understand that, <clears throat> you know, this universe is very much composed of individuals, mm-hmm. but not of independent individuals. That sense yeah. of independence, I think, begins to sort of yeah. uh, shift, you know, fade away. And this is a classic mm-hmm. awakening experience that I think can be experienced by anyone, you know, no matter where they are in their own sort of developmental journeys. Absolutely. And there's some unique qualities that come online at particular stages of development, which right. we'll talk about a bit today. Yeah, it's a great way of putting this in. There's two words that come up for me in, in everything you just shared about this you know, dissolving of the feeling of separation, you know, of inner and outer. And classically, I might think of the word interconnection, you know, interdependent co-arising, things like that. But funny enough for me, this is just me, the word that comes up in integral to express that often is simultaneity. And Mm -hmm. I think it came up from Ken talking about the four quadrants being tetra arising. And so this simultaneous arising captures a little bit of the spirit of what integral awakening is. So it's not just like, ah, now I can rest in this direct experience of being of oneness and of interconnectedness with all things and all beings, but it's the feeling of the simultaneity of the complexity of who we are, of what reality is. And then it's like, okay, well, how do I awaken through this and as this and respond, you know, in the classic bodhisattva sense, an integral bodhisattva, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 100%. Yeah. No. And it's interesting when we sort of reconcile this notion of simultaneity with, you know, one of my sort of background hobbies, I love watching videos about physics, right? Mm. I, I love physics. I, I, so I, I go to like uh, the PBS space time channel on yeah. YouTube and yeah. um, I just kind of geek out with, with, uh, with physics for a while. I think there's just something about, I spend so much time with these very, very abstract ideas. Mm. Sometimes I like to just kind of uh. push, you know, these, these sort of dense little <clears throat> objects around. Makes sense. Um, sort of. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Which isn't to say that, you know, uh, it's any less confusing down in the basement of reality than it is sort of, a, you know. On, it's a different different ceiling. flavor. Yeah. It's a, it's a different flavor right. of, uh, of samsara for sure. But, you know, one of the points that physicists make is that, you know, ultimately, really, there's no such thing as simultaneity. Mm. That every experience in the universe is separated to some degree by space and time, even Mm. if we're talking like the tiniest possible fractions of space and time, Mm. right? Like right Mm. now, me and you are having a simultaneous experience because Mm. our field of awareness is large enough to include everything I'm saying, everything you're saying. We have a memory of of everything that we've Mm. previously said. So it feels like we're sharing a moment. Mm. And yet, if you really, really zoom in and look at the details... The moment of simultaneity that you're experiencing Mm -hmm. is actually a little bit different than the moment of simultaneity that I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so again, you see it right there. There is an implicit sort of separation between Mm -hmm. entities, between Mm -hmm. holons, Mm -hmm. between, you know, manifestations in the universe, but there's no independence between those, Mm -hmm. right? So even though we don't share a physically simultaneous moment, because time changes, you know, as space changes, it's one of the wackiest things that we learn in, in physics, even though it's impossible to, for us to share that simultaneous moment on a one-to-one kind of basis, there is something about consciousness itself yeah. that transcends right. your location. Right. 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 So this is working right with, you know, non-dual teachings and the contemplative side. What does it mean to work with the four quadrants? from the perspective yeah. of awakening and uh, polarities, right? All this yep. comes up of like, well, what's our understanding of what you just said in real time as practitioners? Yeah. Yeah. How do we realize yeah, and it's, that it's, directly? Yep. Yep. And it's a fascinating <clears throat> thing because when I take the physicists seriously in terms of when they say, you know, no, no two subjects actually occupy a simultaneous moment in time, there's always uh-huh. that, you know, speed limit to the universe and uh-huh. that's the speed of light. When they say that, though, I ask myself a secondary question, which is, if that's true, right, if that's true, then how can we take literally the idea that consciousness is a singular to which the plural is unknown? And I love taking that quote, like, Mm. absolutely literally, because that is itself what transcends 
space and time and separation Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of the illusions around simultaneity. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, we might all occupy our own sort of territory in space and time, Mm -hmm. but that which is occupying is the same universal right. witness from yes. one subject yeah, to the yeah, next yeah, subject. Right. To the next right. subject. And I just find that such a, a, a fascinating. Idea. Absolutely. I love, and I, and fascination, you know, wonder is an important quality. Well, an important realization and something we can cultivate that I think is absolutely for me key in a path of interval awakening. It's like, if I can keep coming back over and over to that wonder and curiosity, which is not to say uh, lacking teeth or lacking willpower mm-hmm. and response. No, no, no. But it's just a key ingredient of awakening is just being, wow, this is fascinating. We'll talk all day about it, get very specific, get very nuanced, get very discerning, which is really helpful, you know, using an integral map and still, what is this? Right. It's like yeah. Being alive yeah. in reality is weird. It's, it is weird. <laughs> well, and that's, I think that's one of the things that we get turned on to as we begin to take more seriously this sort of, you know, awakening process is the perception that we have of the world is in so many ways flawed, right? It's mm. in so many, like, we're born into this human body, mm. which has a very narrow window of sensory perceptions that are available to us. You know, we see like yeah. this, this little fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, and we, we take that as being real. We mm. have a hard time seeing sort of realities at a, at a smaller scale until way late in the human story when we began to invent things like microscopes and you know and so forth where we were able to really look at how this reality is fundamentally composed Hmm. in terms of you know in terms of the lower holons Hmm. none of which is obvious to us right Hmm. there are so many aspects of this thing that we call reality that are just completely not obvious Hmm. and i think the awakening process part of that is sort of this disillusionment with the the various modes of perception that we've been conditioned to right. think is real. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas you know, go back in time, 5,000 years ago, <clears throat> people 5,000 years ago, they had a very, very different experience of the world. There were some, you know, universals in there for sure, yeah. but they had a very, very different perception, just an actual perception of the world. Yeah. We have the advantage of, you know, a, a, a few millennia of accumulated knowledge and wisdom to help sort of reorient us. But, you know, why wouldn't we also believe that our perception is fundamentally flawed? Yeah, yeah. So in the context of integral, right? So classically speaking, as you were saying, we might point to basic things like our senses, right? So our limited senses Mm -hmm. and just say like everything we're experiencing, we're processing unconsciously through all these senses. And there's a whole bunch of things that we're taking as real in that process without ever wondering and questioning. Right. And, uh, Lama Lena will describe this as like, you know, you're uh, clumps of these thoughts and experiences and sensations that you take as like this solid entity. And there's problems Mm -hmm. in that in terms of like the problems and suffering stacked upon suffering when we do this. And so first we like, let's unpack, like, what is a basic experience? Right. So, you know, first we're like, oh, there's an object, there's, the sense organ, there's the sense consciousness, there's the mental reflections, things like this, there's a reaction. We start breaking it all down to see how this is all functioning. And then there can be some liberation in that. I think one of the things that integral awakening adds to it, you know, and kudos to Ken for this is similarly to recognizing the unconscious operating of, of senses, meaning making, which you were pointing to here Mm -hmm. is that, oh, this is another thing that has gone on unconsciously that colors our experience too much in a certain way, because we can then become aware that, oh, we do make meaning continually through structures of consciousness. And once we can recognize that there is some freedom, we, we don't, we're not free from structure, structures of consciousness or meaning making, but there is freedom around it. And that, oh my gosh, guess what? We interpret our awakening from wherever we're at developmentally that's a huge shift huge evolution of what yeah. awakening is yeah. and we can include that and yeah, work with of, that consciously yeah no it's well said one of my favorite examples that ken offers of that is you know anyone can come along and say something like i am one with everything right yes but the definition of the word i mm-hmm. <laughs> of the word one and the word everything 
changes pretty dramatically from yes. one stage to the yes. next. Yes. Right? Yes. So so if we are at an early stage of development and we have an experience of I am one with everything, well, yep. you are one with everything that you are currently aware of. Yeah. And it just so happens that That's there a, are yes. realities that you are not yet aware of because you yep. do not yet have the developmental capacity we cannot yet include certain kinds of complexity. Yeah. So therefore you cannot <laughs> yet include them. That's right. Yeah. You are one with everything. And yet there's a huge, massive, yeah. you know, sort of upside down iceberg <laughs> yes. that remains over your head that you can't be one with. Yeah. And that is, that is one of the things that the growing up process brings with it is an increasing capacity to perceive sort of the nuances and the subtleties of reality. Any subject of our awareness can become an object of awareness. And then we can then become yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can collapse that subject and that <clears throat> object together. Yeah. But if you can't, if, if you're not able to perceive it in the first place, you can't be one with it. Yeah. And so it limits our own awakening, our development and our ability to respond, you know, and taking it on the compassion side in terms of meeting people where they're at, which is a big gift of recognizing development truly and i think that still takes work we're all probably working with that in some way of like okay how can i use my integral awareness to truly meet people where they are and in context it makes sense we're not going to be best friends with everybody in the world but it's like we are going to run into people who are at different developmental vantage points you know so to speak so how do i meet them and we look at it from awakening and using a map like kin's states of consciousness state stages that can help where again we can't escape interpreting awakening. But if we can simplify things to a certain degree and say like, oh, okay, yeah, everybody has access to the subtle state. I can meet somebody if I can recognize, but I have to first see through likely their meaning making to be able to sense and taste that, oh, you know what? This person who's a very traditional, fundamental, religious kind of person, actually, maybe they're having a state experience of the subtle or the causal which then they interpret and they act upon and then their behaviors might be in a way where we say, whoa, that is very strange or it's harmful or whatever. But how does that change how I relate to them if this is now in my awareness that both their developmental level and their state of consciousness, well, now what do I do with that? And there's right. not, a, I'm not saying there's an answer in that situation, but I have more possibility you know, in terms yeah. of how, what I do. Yeah. No, and you can also get that kind of mismatch when we're looking at the various sort of perspectives that people tend to favor. So like, you know, yeah. the average Buddhist walks into a room and right. really emphasizes a first person, you know, perspective on awakening and starts talking to a Christian friend, for example, who yes. is really emphasizing a second person. Both of them might actually sort of have a, a an implicit mistrust right. of the emphasis of the other, right? Yeah. So yep. someone whose who's practice goes deep into that first person realization process, they might be a little bit doubtful about the, the kinds of data that would be made available by a second person practice mm. with a deity or, mm -hmm. or you know, mm. it doesn't even necessarily need to be deity, you know, sort of out there somewhere, but can be an emphasis on selfless service, an emphasis on bringing compassion, an emphasis on helping others, being mm -hmm. kind, mm -hmm. right? These are simple yeah. second person practices that don't necessarily come naturally with a first person realization. Yeah, exactly. And vice versa. And vice yeah. versa. You know, the person who's really into prayer or, you know, the second person practices might be a little bit you know, skeptical of what they perceive as a bit of hubris, maybe when it comes to first yeah, person practice. Oh, yeah. so you're saying you're God, you know, what? what, what right, right. Um, yes, yes. So for me, the importance of what you're saying, and like practically speaking means that we become more experientially comprehensive in our awakening and our, how we practice. So it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to be natural that I have my certain dispositions. And I, I mentioned this like in the the lesson on awakened typology. I like I, I spell out this like long descriptor of who I am. It's like I'm mm. a non-dual embodied Buddhist, blah, 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 type four. Like this is me. Like generally speaking, I gravitate to these like 12 descriptors, but I try mm. to include more and become aware of, at least in an essential way, of like the areas in which I don't engage. So a silly example is like, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I started trying to read up more on economics and legal situations, you know? So if a court case comes out in Supreme court, I want to actually look at the legal uh, opinions written because I'm like, I don't spend a lot of time down there. And so I leave it out of my awareness of sorts. It's not really included experientially. 
So anyways, but just you gave a perfect example of that, right? Uh, of like how this plays out in real time between like a Buddhist and a Christian or, you know, you can say somebody who lives in a cave practicing all the time versus somebody who's talking about uh, inflation. <laughs> it's like right. how do those two things relate, right? Um, right? But as practitioners, if we can include practices and experiences that span the map, that's better. But we need a good map to help us hone in you know, so we don't get utterly overwhelmed right. by everything happening, you know, all at once. That's right. All of this is important. So all of this, I think, is looking at, you know, again, sort of this meaning making or sense making aspect yeah. of, of spirituality. Right. Right. But there's so much more to awakening than just that, right? I mean, yeah. awakening is, we were talking about it in pre-show, there's a few different factors that seem to, to, to come with this. There's the sense making piece, the meaning making piece. There's the perceptual piece, right? Like when... I think back to some of my major awakening experiences, the first mm -hmm. one of which happened when I was about 19 years old or so. Mm -hmm. I perceived the world in a radically different way after that experience than mm -hmm. I did before right. that experience. So right. there's something about having these, you know, temporary state experiences yeah. that somehow rewires your hardware in a certain kind of way, rewires yeah. your nervous system. Right. So that of all the, of the things that you pay attention to, certain things are coming to the foreground yeah. um, a little bit more easily. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that perceptual piece as well. Yeah. And the perceptual shift then ripples out right in our life. And I know we can talk about meaning making, sense making, but not from, I think when I go beyond that, so it's not, we often talk about that in terms of developmental stages. It's not exclusively mm -hmm. that, but, but being able to look in all directions and, and feel out how these transformations, these awakenings ripple out and impact our life. And I, you know, one of my mentors had said that, Hey, after a particular powerful experience, like what you described, it can take us a year, years to fully integrate and understand what that was, which kind of sometimes doesn't make sense because it's like, well, it was so, it's so immediately clear like beyond words, but in terms of understanding, well, like how's this impacting the work I do and how I experience friendship and love and politics, and all, you know, the four quadrants, right? The whole yeah. integral map, having that for me, it's a both and, right? So it's like being mm -hmm. able to look in those directions, having a map that helps me know where to look. It's just really useful just for the perceptual shift. Just like what a relief because without that, Sometimes the, those, those awakenings, even though a lot of times they feel amazing, not always, mm -hmm. it can be difficult. It can be a real challenge yeah. to, to integrate those into our life. That was yeah. the case for me. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think a lot of times, Ryan, this stuff can actually be a little bit dangerous. Awakening mm -hmm. can be dangerous yes. to a self system that is not itself stable enough to support that realization or maybe exists in a, you know, cultural context that is not suitable for that kind yeah. of experience. Yeah, the you know, cultural context, For me, right? my, my, my <laughs> first awakening experience, my first Satori experience, it was, you know, as you say, some of them can be, you know, wonderful, big, beautiful, love and light kind of experiences. My first one was not. I had a very sort of, you know, it felt like an apocalyptic sort of mm. spiritual experience where it was mm. a total collapse mm. of perception. Mm. Everything that I thought was true about myself, who I was, what the world was, how it worked, it all got sort of suddenly flipped inside out. And I experienced that as, you know, basically a violent experience. Mm -hmm. It was kind of ironic because, I mean, which isn't to say that there wasn't the beauty behind it. There absolutely was. You know, I, I definitely had this sensation that like, okay, I am having an experience right now that somehow makes me more aware of the universal qualities that are mm -hmm. shared between me and all other human beings. Mm -hmm. I could feel that. It mm -hmm. was like I could feel that in mm -hmm. my in my skin. Mm -hmm. At the same time, after the experience, I didn't feel closer to people. I felt more alienated from people because I had this experience that I was trying to find words for that my closest friends had not had. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have the words for. So anytime I tried yeah. to share my experience, I just felt a little bit sort of crazy, I mean, right? Yeah. And that actually created a greater gap between me. So for That's me, the when I had that experience, experience, yeah, totally, totally. My context and my own development yeah. was not stable enough to to support that experience, and so it, it did. It took me a good eight or nine years, I think, probably, to mm. really authentically grow into. What do you? What experience. were some? What helped you to do that? I'm just curious. Like over over those eight or nine years, what are some standout? I don't know. I don't fill in the blank here, but like, 
what do you think helped yeah. to, I mean, I, obviously passage of time, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the sort of the natural accumulation of experiences yeah. and, you know, wisdoms and all that for sure. Yeah. Um, really though, honestly, I mean, after I had that experience, you know, again, I had no sort of template for this. I had no role model. I didn't know that experiences like this were. were that didn't, that, and that didn't spirit. arise like in a spiritual context just for that. that I think that's what yeah, I was. No, implying. exactly. Yeah, it's not so, like I was, right. I was seeking it yeah, yeah. going out. It just sort of happened. It, it just sort of happened. on yeah. my head. Yeah. Right? Spontaneous. It crashed on my head. Yeah. And it began to open me up to, you know, I, I was like, well, I need to learn more about this. There's, surely there are other human beings to whom this, this yeah. has happened. I need to yeah. start, you know, learn. and that began really my my sort of intellectual spiritual journey. And, and you know, the first six months were really tender. Yeah. And I noticed myself going down sort of all sorts of different blind alleys and getting more interest. You know, I was visiting the New Age section in mm -hmm. the Barnes and Noble or the Borders near me yeah, more often. Sure. And, We've and, all been there. And because of that, I feel very lucky that it only took me about six months after that experience to discover Ken's work. Uh -huh, yeah, right? It, it felt yeah. like this sort, sort of like illuminated path that led me to yeah. Ken's work. And I feel like that, that itself saved me so much time. Mm. Right. And not only that, it saved me time that I didn't have to spend in sort of some of these narcissistic spiritual, yeah. you know, new age circles that right. are out there, which, uh, you know, are, again, are very, ironically can take you further away from these experiences because yeah. it really reinforces the self and how amazing and unique and important myself must have been to have that experience. Right. And what happens sidebar of like with things we might talk about cleaning up, right? So like this has an impact of like wherever we're at in our own healing journey. And then the impact of awakening experiences like that can create new trauma or exacerbate trauma where do you have. And then if you go down these really kind of unhelpful, let's say, but at least spiritual solutions pathways, it can double down all that and make, you know, make it even worse, right? Exacerbate the problem. Dude, you just, you nailed something that <laughs> is totally true in my experience. So much of my spiritual journey has been almost like PTSD mm. from that initial awakening. Experience. Interesting. Yeah. That's not as common. That's, that, I can really feel that. And I can yeah. feel how I compensated for that, particularly in my twenties, right? Yeah. Where like suddenly I was very invested in having a spiritual identity, right? So yeah. I love to talk about this stuff. Uh -huh. I would, you know, uh -huh. I, I was obnoxious about it. Like I, anyone who was willing to listen, I wanted sure. to know, like I had this experience yeah. and it totally reformatted my entire life. And, yeah. you know, Right. I was just going on these sort of narcissistic sort of trips and, you know, really wearing this stuff on my sleeve yeah. as a way to compensate for the sort of alienation and the isolation that yeah. I felt sort of after the experience. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't Ryan until, and you and I have talked about this before, it wasn't actually until, you know, almost a decade ago now when my daughter, you know, had her liver yeah. transplant when that flipped for me again, mm. right? And I mm. noticed that mm. in that experience, which was one of total emergency, mm -hmm. right? In total emergency, all of the accumulated, you know, mm. thoughts and ideas and symbols and ornaments and all the things I would wear in my sleep, in that moment, none of those served me anymore. None of mm. them served me anymore. Mm. And so I felt like suddenly stripped mm. of this spiritual identity that I mm. had sort of fashioned for mm. myself yeah. over, you know, this preceding 20 years or so. Right. And it was, it was, it was painful. It was, um, it was simultaneously very much like a dark night, yeah. right? Because it's like, here's all these pieces of myself, these objects that made me feel like I was connected with the universe. And, and suddenly that is all going away. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's gone. And all I'm left with is, you know, I described it as just three steps repeated over and over again, just a cycle mm -hmm. of three presence, compassion, mm -hmm. put one step in front of the other mm -hmm. presence, compassion, put one step in front of the other. So while everything was being stripped away, everything that was no longer necessary or, or, mm -hmm. or no longer serving me, was being stripped away. Mm -hmm. I was left with this, what felt to me anyway, retroactively looking at it because I didn't have time to think about it when it was actually happening. But, you know, looking back at it, it felt like a grace in a certain kind of way. Mm. It felt like it was a quieting of yeah. my sort of separate spiritual self. Right. And I was, I was sort of coming to rest mm. in what is really real in that mm -hmm. awakening experience, mm -hmm. which is simply presence, compassion, mm. put one step in front of the other action. Mm. Right. Mm, and, beautiful. you know, ever since that experience, right, I'd say for the last 10 years, yeah, yeah. I'm less comfortable talking about my 
you know, my, my spirituality or, mm. you know, which is funny being sort of a host of shows like this, where it's just, it's <laughs> right. just, it's just I'm not yeah, sure. too interested in talking about that yeah, anymore yeah. because, yeah. because that life has, has become simultaneously more quiet, but more profound for me. Mm, makes, kind of makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Corey, thanks for sharing that. I feel like, I mean, your journey in a lot of ways really embodying bodies and expresses what an integral awakening is and can be. So we talk a lot about awakening in these formal senses because they emerge out of classical awakening, right? So we'll talk about practices and mm -hmm. paths and stages and all this stuff. And sometimes though, even when context that in being integral practitioners, sometimes in a weird way, like the rest of life seems something different that like mm -hmm. perpetuates mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. that's a stage thing too, I think. But your first experience that rocked your world and left you shaken in a kind of difficult mm -hmm. way, happened spontaneous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your kind of like deeper liberation from that and just dropping in was also you being in the midst of your life, you know, with mm -hmm. your girl and partner. And, and it's like, mm -hmm. that's awakening, you yeah. know? And, yeah. it, and I know you've done a lot of different formal practice, things like that. And you've had, you've been sure. in your geek for a long time, but yeah, path can be exactly like that. Mm-hmm. So what I'm curious about your experience, Ryan. So when did you have your original initial awakening experience or series of experiences? Yeah. And it seems like you, you know, you went sort of a different direction on that path. So you've been, you know, really yeah. in, you know, specifically the Buddhist lineage. Yeah, I did that a lot uh, yep, for, been for my, a while now. My bag, so yeah. is <laughs> how did that connect for you? So, yeah, I was just thinking about this the other day a little bit in hearing you talk. Obviously, I have a ton of formal practice and study and yeah, I've been doing it for a long time. Honestly, though, it's just, I had to do it, you know, kind of thing. I never had a plan of it going anywhere except for I was drawn to it. But also I feel like my path, I relate to your story more than I do when I hear people talk about being on retreats. And I've done like, you know, the longest one I did was like a month solitary when that was fucking crazy. Oh. And like that rocked me hard. It was a tough one. Came out Okay, on the other end, but that was tough. That rocked me. But when people talk about, oh, I've been this formal practice and these experiences happen in the formal practice, yeah, that's happened for me tons. I feel like it's more life, though. I feel like, you know, kind of like a cartoonish falling down a mountain and then you just roll up, <laughs> hitting trees and stuff, and then stand yeah. up, you're like, ah, I made it. <laughs> it's, it's a little like that, less so these days. I feel like, too, kind of like in relating to your story about like things quieted down, like, there's a shift where like after a while it's, it's, it's not as big of a deal. Like it's just, here we are. Okay, cool. And life is what it is. And there's still practice and there's still difficulty challenges, but a big bulk of the, the bigger gusto part of my path, i just felt like it was life, like suffering and just like the doorway of suffering and coming upon it, honestly, being in a small town in Missouri and undergrad and even smaller town in grad school, 25 years ago when none of this shit was like cool and, you, and we were definitely weird at that time right mm -hmm. whenever we found ken and the mm -hmm. cool amongst other integral people but weird outside of it and i practiced in the midst of a bunch of you know more rural like folks and bible belts and things like that so me with my <laughs> buddhist statues it's like you know i was coming upon it honestly that's why i would say it's like i wasn't trying to have an identity but i was just like hey maybe this will help right i just intuitively found my way to it uh, in, in integral. So a lot of my life experience is getting beat down and heartbroken, you know, failing, just life over and over. That's been a bigger driver. Now, so many beautiful experiences sticking with it that are also deeply the love, the opening, the relief that can come over and over with practicing and waking up. Definitely motivators. It can't just be all bad stuff, but the initial doorway is just like, got to do something different. This ain't working. Right. Right. Um, but once I got on the path then yeah, I did a lot of formal practice. I was all about it. And I don't know what I thought would happen when I first got on it. I just felt like, Hey, this sounds better than what I've been doing. Acknowledging the mm. deep suffering and a lot of ways being way more honest with it. It's like, we all suffer and we all are going to die. Like that's B the Buddhist first turning message. So point blank, not beating around the bush. But then like, hey, it's workable, it's doable. There is liberation in a certain way from this continual, especially unconscious hooking into patterns of suffering. There's freedom and possibility, goodness, wholeness. So like, okay, I like that. That was some good 
good news for me at that time in my life. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, then going down the path and there was certain moments of different sorts of uh, awakenings that can be mapped on stages. You know, I know I did a, a little week long retreat with Vince for Corey Horn, our good buddy, my co-founder of Buddhist Geeks. We did something out in Crestone. That was one little retreat where I would call it a stream entry from the progress of insight, uh, you know, official unleashing in, into reality. But then it keeps going, you know, then there was like another disillusionment there. And I talk about this a lot in the course of unpacking it because it's a bigger conversation, but you know, there's these cycles of like seeking efforting and breakthrough and disillusionment and equanimity and relief and maturing, you know, and that's from the phase of insight that Vince Horn and his partner, Emily Horn created. So I relate to that in a very, I like that model because it feels like, you know, you sharing your story, Mm -hmm. the organic nature of our lives the humble unfolding of it. I relate to that. It's like, oh yeah, these waves, but it's deepening, but there are waves and it's not all of one flavor. So I've had that over time, you know, and of course, like really something that you just said about like not talking about spiritual things, maybe as formally or as in the same way you did in the past, there was a phase after that one breakthrough awakening experience where just naturally, again, this over time, I, and always already sort of recognition where I'm like, yeah, practice is good, but I don't need to do practice or I don't like, I, I can't seek something out of practice and feel like it's going to change something mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. illusion dissolved where I'm like, no, I know like in one sense, there's this deep okayness of just being. So that's relieving and you figure that's it. And sometimes we can hold on to that and we, and, and that's where things go bad. It goes to the dark side where it's like, we just try to maintain this ego identity with always already. But what happened after that is like, yeah, but, I'm a fucking mess. So there's this simultaneous and integral helps with this. It's like, yeah, we are all always already awake. What a fucking relief. Oh, it's such a relief. At the same time, it's like, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a mess. Things are just fucked up. You know, all you do, I, this is the Ram Dass quote. So you think you're online and go spend a week with your family, but <laughs> we, we can find a million different ways to say, oh yeah, I'll go watch the news or go do this, go do that. And the other, and quickly right. you'll be like, oh, things aren't as perfectly cheery as we thought. Right. So yeah, it's like, well, then there was a period of disillusionment where I'm like, what do I do? You know, cause I, I can't just practice incessantly cause that's dissolved and evaporated, but yet I feel like I need practice. And it took a while then to coming back around to embodiment practice, which is really an integrating practice. It's like, how do I embody this awakening? How do I continue integrating, waking up and cleaning up, waking up and growing up, integrating these different kinds of ups that felt different in the past. Mm-hmm. The simultaneity is what I refer to here. It's like, what? Well, I'm all of these things that this points to. So like, it's all happening at once. So how do I work with all that? Then there was a little bit more purpose, right? And so, you know, path keeps on going of like this, where I don't worry about it as much anymore. I have a little bit more trust in saying like, yeah, there's gonna be awakenings. There's gonna be shifts. Gonna get beat down. Gonna get back up again, you know? But having a suite of tools, a great community of close friends like you and Vince and larger communities like Buddhist Geeks and Integral Life, the map, lots of practices, I feel pretty good as much as I can, you know, in one life. It's beautiful. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. And, you know, as, as I'm as I'm listening to you, Ryan, you know, a few things come to mind is, you know, the first thought I have is that awakening will show up for different people in different ways. Yeah. According to yeah. their needs, their conditions, their experiences. Yeah. Their cosmic address. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. For me, it was, you know, I can very much feel how... You know, and it, and it might be one of the things that actually made that original sort of awakening experience possible in the first place. I can see now in retrospect, I was in the middle of a major stage transition. I was, you know, mm. it was my first year in college. I could feel, yeah, yeah. you know, my thinking about my own thinking in a different way. And yeah. I would later learn through Ken's material that I was really making a big transition from an orange stage into a green stage. Yeah, the same for me. Yeah. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, you know, I, again, I feel very grateful that as I was entering that green stage, I also found Ken's work yeah. that could help sort of shepherd me through that That's green great. stage. Yeah. Until, you know, until I could. Yeah. You know. But I could also feel how so much of that experience and my own path of awakening was colored and tempered by just sort of the body mind I was born into. And I think this is something that becomes increasingly clear to us at later stages of development 
you know, particularly like, like the construct aware stages, where you begin to realize just how much of yourself is an accident of birth, hmm. right? It hmm. really is an accident of birth. Like hmm. I have the political and economic views that I have because I happen to be born in a particular region in a particular culture at a particular time. And I make sense of the world because I was born into that. And there's so much of this, you know, there's so much of, of our own identity mm -hmm. that we cannot actually take sort of responsibility for. I didn't create this. It was sort of, right. I was born into this. Right. right. And so one of the things I think this body mind was born into was an experience of insecure attachment. Mm. And that insecure mm -hmm. attachment, I can really see how that flavored my spiritual path, particularly in the early phases where I really sort of overcompensated for that insecure attachment by like, you know, a lot of my spiritual identity was coming from a place of lack. I had an experience mm -hmm. of devastating wholeness, right? And I want to be more like that because I feel broken down here. Yeah. I can remember a feeling of wholeness being possible. I'm lacking that. I yeah. want to. I want to do everything I can. I can to get to that. Right? right. A lot of that was animated by my own insecure attachment, and then, funny enough, that same insecure attachment became sort of a, a wisdom for me later in life. When you know, you and me and Vince talked about this during one of our episodes a year and a half ago, mm. talking about the illusion of ground, the illusion mm -hmm. that we actually have a solid yeah. place to rest. Yeah. You never really do. You never really do. That rug is always being pulled out from under you. And then you think you find another ground and then that gets pulled out from under you and you think you find another ground. And, oh, you know, eventually you have to accept this is this is groundless, right? This ground of being does yeah. not exist in the well, manifest world. Yeah. And there's a part of that, that my insecure attachments, like I knew it, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you right. know what I mean? I knew it. Oh, I, I, I had this feeling the whole time. Yeah. Well, that's why like we can have the, the cycling of, I feel like for all of us, and I relate to that too, of maturing where like sometimes that recognition of groundlessness is, you know, scary or like makes us cynical or, or, or feeds into it. Or and other times it's relieving and liberating, like, oh, good. Thank goodness that I'm not fundamentally hooked into every experience that's going on, like things rise and pass. But it depends where we're at and what's going on. I mean, phase wise, but day to day, you know, but I think that's part of the gift of a path awakening is that disentangling the ability to disentangle and the the insights that that um, that emerge by recognizing oh yeah it is groundless and that means i can disentangle from thoughts patterns experiences but it doesn't eliminate them patterns keep on going and again the sidebar here is like well, why would we want to eliminate all that that's all the the dynamic arising of life that makes it interesting right, right? um right. but i don't want to sit in a cave and stare at a wall yeah we're not going to pure void we can unhook from it, everything happening. And there's a right. process of that, like we just talked about. But that I think that kind of lubricates up um, our ability to practice in an integral way, because it's like, I can unhook from where I tend to bias if we look through the integral lens. That means, oh, okay, well, I can have more flexibility to open up and practice and engage with others in life in ways that I might not have because I have this. And, you know, you, I loved how you phrased this of like, you're like, you're, this body mind is like this and you described your disposition, you know? And so like me growing up, I was super socially anxious. You know, I didn't even realize it until grad Same. school after finishing my master's in counseling psych and then reading through a social anxiety disorder. I'm like, I, I have that. <laughs> that is good. I was relieved. I was excited. I was like, yes, the whole life. Right. And one of the things I appreciate, uh, I know I reference Lamelina a lot. She's she's just so entertaining and so blunt, but she will refer to herself, especially in kind of like the Buddhist metaphysics cosmology thing, you know, with rebirth. And she's like, she's a deep person. She is very awake, but she'll she has her disposition, and she'll say like, well, you know, like I'm a this this incarnation, this body is like more fidgety and more start. I'm startled more easily, and all these kinds of things. All of her quirks are still here. There's some mm -hmm. relief and humor about it, like taking this larger right. perspective that regardless of the cosmology, but she's like, okay, well, what, what does it mean if this is groundless? And if we just take for a moment, extend the metaphysics to rebirth, it's like, this is just this, this life, you know, I'm taking more relief and, and entertainment with it now. It's like, yeah, these are my quirks in this life. That's what I got. 
but yeah. we can work with it all. Yeah, that's right. But then again, how, how to work with it all, an integral map where we make more discernment, even if we want to include more than what we have in our typical Ken Wilbur map, it's a damn good start. So I keep coming back yeah, around that, like, okay, how do we deeply unhook and disentangle and wake up and continue evolving in this yep. life? Same, beautifully said. You know, one of the reasons why you and I get along so well, Ryan, is that we have a lot of we have yeah. a lot of similarities. You know, yeah. we have a lot of similar deep structure dysfunction. Yeah, we're enneagram fours. <laughs> right. Yes, right, totally. Which is yeah. automatically going to make us like total, you know, you know, drama queens. Yeah, when we're, it comes to our drama twins experience. Yeah, <laughs> to, totally, totally. <laughs> no, and and Ken's work. That's exactly what it represented to me because again, I felt like well, I'm not sure if. I felt like the the thunderbolt of sudden, you know, awakening experience. I'm not sure if that's what made me fall apart or if that's just simply what made me aware that I was already sort of broken and fragmented, right? It, yeah. it brought about that feeling. And to me, Ken's work in particular became sort of this hole in the wall. And if I could just get through that hole, that crack in the wall and make it to the other side, then I would be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Right. right? I would be yeah. able to take all these broken pieces of myself that I see on the floor right. and start reassembling, reconstructing them into something like a real, you know, an actual human being. Yeah. Sort of a Humpty Dumpty Pinocchio story. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of mashing up my fathers right. here. Right. Um, but that's really what it represented to me, you know, and, and a real, I, I remember having that actual visual in my head of, of that, that crack in the right, wall. Right. And what I've begun, what I've begun to realize afterward is, you know, it comes down to these, these phases of awakening and there was nothing wrong with that. You know, I kind of make fun of myself for it. Sort of the imaginal vivid phase of my spiritual life of my mm. spiritual identity, mm -hmm. but there was nothing inherently wrong with that phase because it brought me, you know, I like to say it brought me to a door and and I'm and I'm grateful that it brought me to that door to this gate. I just couldn't walk through the gate with all of those sort of attachments that I was creating for myself. Yeah. It was the same thing. <clears throat> this feeling of lack that brought me into integral in the first place. You know, I I've talked about it many times. I very much had one of those golden shadow projections onto onto Ken Wilber. Sure. Right. Yeah. So when I first met him and I began to realize how <laughs> human he is, yeah. right? right? And he doesn't live up to these projections uh -huh. of of you know yeah. godliness that I yeah. that I put hum in my imaginal yeah. space. Right. I, I had no choice but to reclaim some of those golden shadows. Uh -huh. But if I followed the golden shadow uh -huh. all the way to my integral career. Right. right? I mean your golden so shadows right? are sort of pulling you in a particular direction. And the important right. thing I think is to pay enough attention to start heading in that direction. Eventually you'll catch that golden projection, that golden shadow. It's, you know, it's like the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, right? This was my right. rabbit that brought me down yeah, my particular yeah, yeah, rabbit yeah. hole. Yeah. And I'm so glad that, you know, I, at the time it felt like it required a lot of courage to follow that because I was going against the grain of what the rest of the conventional world was, was telling me was important and yeah. true. Yeah. And real. And yeah. suddenly I'm like, I, yeah, I kind of feel like this is more important right now. And I went in that direction. Yeah. And, I love that. You know, thank God I did. Yeah. I love that. There's a lot of, I think, compassion taking that view and then some wisdom with it too. Like I've, if we have some ideal that things will happen in some perfect manner, if we just align ourselves correctly and practice in the right way, which is like, that's not going to pan out. And yet at the same time, kind of like a tantric perspective of like, hey, rather than feeling like we need to avoid negative emotions, we actually embrace them because there's an essential energy in them that can manifest as wisdom. It's the same thing. You're like, hey, this is how life is. It's like, it's all of it happening at once. And it's like, yeah, I had to deal with some projections and stuff, but it also brought me here to this deeper way of being and engaging in the world. So take it all at once <laughs> kind of approach. Yeah. 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 So and I, I was thinking to, um, you know, of something that it, I think makes an integral awakening, an integral Dharma. And, you know, we've been talking about this, obviously, of course, with this multiplayer group of practicing as integral we's and that even in our journeys, we've already talked about this, that it wasn't, yeah, sometimes we can feel we have an isolated individual experience, like a spontaneous experience like you had, right? And you had no context for it and nobody to talk to at the time, which was painful, right? Because you felt mm -hmm. isolated, you felt disconnected. Violet. So that's an indication of how important that quadrant is as part of an integral. And I always feel like I have to 
put some caveats here to say like we're not dipping down into to only pluralism we're including things yeah. that come up with like that pluralistic we space because it's important but like we had integral naked back then right how right. amazing was that that like we weren't waking up by ourselves we were waking up together even if we weren't in the same places that all of these ideas about awakening were simultaneously in, informing us and in how we practice like it's that is an interconnection and integral awakening so we had an integral communities in person and online which was a godsend for me at that time and being carney nebraska with you know early 2000s and being like oh my god on my laptop my giant laptop i can turn into integral naked in, in these conversations and now integral life here you know of, of being able yeah. to we're not alone in the practice and we, right. we really have to wake up together and especially when we look at this is a big year here in the united states an election year things like that and then everything going on in the world definitely feels like integral is needed integral awakening is actually needed, not as an ideal, which maybe felt for me more like this big idea. Ken, I think, was way ahead of his time in, in SES. But at the time, it was more like, this is fascinating and interesting. Look at these models and maps. And now it's like, fuck, we need these. That's right. Like, yeah. we're going to make it through it. And so how do we wake up, you know, and our unique paths, as you mentioned, like our unique cosmic addresses, but also kind of like unique we cosmic addresses, right, of like the people we're connected to the work we're doing in the world, the communities we're part of, and how does that connect with the even bigger picture that it feels unavoidable. I think that's the terrifying thing. And the big opportunity is that like, everything feels unavoidable now. And so right. what are we going to do with that? And this so, brings me yeah. back to a previous episode we did, Ryan, Inhabit Your Purpose. Yeah. Where we were talking about the integral ikigai. Yeah. Where the challenge, I think, is to take these you know, often divine feeling inspirations that we're being flooded with that are just sort of, you know, overflowing in a certain sense. Because I do think this is yeah. an important quality of integral spirituality is it's not sort of a silo that's sitting over here separate from yes. all the other aspects of your life. Like it mm. floods in, right? right? It begins to permeate all of your relationships and all of your work and all of your hobbies and all of your, you know, the, the kinds of entertainment and joy that you get from the world and you know it really spills into all of this and you begin yes. to realize that it's not a separate kind of category um of our lives it's yeah. actually sort yeah. of this bottomless source that is always replenishing itself right. and spilling into right. the rest of our reality so the idea here is that is that awakening is not inert right, right? like right. awakening is is this active dynamic process dynamic. and it's yep. asking you to participate with yep. it Yep. And when it comes to participating with something like the awakening experience, yep. this calls into not just meaning making, but purpose making, right? What yep. is mine to do? What, yeah. wh why is this human consciousness, right? Becoming self-aware and what the hell is it supposed to do now? Right. right? What is its contribution? Yeah. And that brings us to this sense of purpose. And for me, you know, the way I've metabolized my own experience and, and sort of the path, you know, that that's unfolded ever since is, is as you were saying, I remember those sort of dark ages yeah. of, you know, before the internet, before <laughs> integral naked, yeah. where I was a lonely integral Island where literally yeah. I could not talk about this stuff, which yeah. had become the most important thing in my life. I could not talk about this stuff without like teaching the entire model. So I wasn't very popular at the time because no one wanted to hear this <laughs> yeah. shit. Right. And it's not like you can just drop a 900 pound, you know, or 900 page yeah. felt like 900 pounds sometimes a 900 yeah. page Ken Wilber book on their heads. Yeah. And you know, they're going to thank you for it. Yeah. So it was very, again, that was part of the isolating kind yeah. of, you know, feeling I had and thank God for it. Thank God that I went through that period of loneliness and isolation yeah. because it made me clear on my purpose, right? Yeah. My purpose was, I don't want anyone to mm. feel lonely or isolated, mm. right? So that's why in 2000, I decided to pick up and move to Boulder, Colorado to get involved with, you know, these new projects that Ken was getting off the ground yeah. because I was like, I need to be a part of this. This is the only thing yeah. that is giving me meaning. Yeah. And it's the only thing that is satisfying this emerging sense of purpose, right? Yeah. Here's, here's my calling. It's increasingly feeling like a calling. Yeah. I just uh, want to make sure no one has to feel yeah. the pain uh -huh. and the violence uh -huh. of being unable mm. to sustain and support such a beautiful awakening experience. Yeah. And I see a lot of people who get clobbered by these experiences. Yeah. 
Well, I'm super grateful that you stuck to your path, man. And I, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of people in the integral life community that I think you've succeeded immensely in creating space and a community for people to, to never have to feel that way. Truly. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, and the most rewarding thing for, for me, Ryan, is the fact that, you know, all of my best friends I've made in this space yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, th th you and I would not know each other if no. it wasn't for this sort yeah. of confluence that Integral, I think, brought we, about. And yeah. this mutual sort of respect and admiration for each other's yeah. you know, awakening paths, I think is so, it's yeah. so gratifying. Yeah. And it could be, I'm glad you brought this up because I know you and I both feel that a ton because of, again, of like where our path started, where it was hard to find people to connect with. And even going through the internet, it was still, you know, it took you some effort, but I can imagine now a lot of people may take it for granted, especially maybe if you're younger, if you've been more immersed in what feels like constant social connection, even if it is superficial surface level at times. We didn't even have that. There was no social media. There wasn't even Google. Right. Okay, peeps. So right. <laughs> imagine those times back in the day. Yeah. Dark uh, ages. I'm dark ages. You. Yeah. So it is like sometimes maybe you don't know how good it is until it's not there. Right. But golly, it's so important to have these spaces like this. And I know the formal study and practice is a huge part of our paths. You know, that's why we have consumed and practiced the integral path and, and our, you know, respective contemplative waking up practices, but gosh, some of the most useful experiences being able to talk like we've done today, being able to talk with yeah. fellow practitioners in a really, a real humble, open way, you know, dropping pretenses and the integral map just gives us a lot of the ability to cross gaps. Whereas like you may have had totally different experiences and formal practices, but we can still talk about them because we have a map that taps into that universality of right. life and gives us ways to yeah connect it's like a rosetta stone you know yeah. everyone is coming to this with their own awakening language yep. in yep. a sense and yep. a lot of those languages can feel incompatible yeah until you find this rosetta exactly. stone where you see like oh okay this, this is beginning exactly. to unlock exactly right yeah i love it yep. yeah Beautiful. well i've got a nice little i thought brian maybe we would yeah. end with uh with a passage from ken that would be um, awesome this has always been you know talk about a thunderbolt this passage has always been mm a thunderbolt of realization wait. for me. I love this passage so much because, you know, Ken's Ken is such a tremendously gifted writer, but one of his greatest gifts is his ability to, you know, both explore great deal of complexity, a great deal of complexity. I mean, some of the ideas and the constructs that yeah. he is creating are so intricate and elegant. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And after he does all that, He'll just wrap it all up into this beautiful little poem, <laughs> yeah. you know, which feels holistic. It's like if he's showing us the beams and the struts and like all the individual parts yeah. of an idea, you know, in his prose, he then integrates it in the form of this poetry. Yeah. And the poetry sh is sort of showing you the wholeness. It's, it's it. actually giving you a feeling of yes. wholeness, yes. you know, not Jesus. just an intellectual understanding of it. That's so huge um, that he does that. Yep. Totally. And this is one of the pieces where that wholeness just runs cool. through it. So cool. this is from uh, one of my favorite books of Ken, One Taste. Uh, Sunday, August 3rd. People typically feel trapped by life, trapped by the universe, because they imagine that they are actually in the universe. And therefore, the universe can squish them like a bug. This is not true. You are not in the universe. The universe is in you. The typical orientation is this. My consciousness is in my body, mostly in my head. My body is in this room. This room is in the surrounding space, the universe itself. That is true from the viewpoint of the ego, but utterly false from the viewpoint of the self. If I rest as witness, the formless I, I, it becomes obvious that right now I am not in my body. My body is in my awareness. I am aware of my body. Therefore, I am not my body. I am the pure witness in which my body is now arising. I am not in my body. My body is in my consciousness. Therefore, be consciousness. If I rest as the witness, the formless I, I, it becomes obvious that right now I am not in this house. This house is in my awareness. I am the pure witness in which this house is now arising. I am not in this house. 
this house is in my consciousness. Therefore, be consciousness. If I look outside this house to the surrounding area, perhaps a large stretch of earth, a big patch of sky, other houses, roads, and cars, if I look, in short, at the universe in front of me, and if I rest as the witness, the formless I, I, it becomes obvious that right now I am not in the universe. The universe is in my awareness. I am the pure witness in which this universe is now arising. I am not in the universe. The universe is in my consciousness. Therefore, be consciousness. It is true that the physical matter of your body is inside the matter of the house and the matter of the house is inside the matter of the universe, but you are not merely matter or physicality. You are also consciousness as such, of which matter is merely the outer skin. The ego adopts the viewpoint of matter and therefore is constantly trapped by matter, trapped and tortured by the physics of pain. But pain, too, arises in your consciousness, and you can either be in pain or find pain in you, so that you surround pain, are bigger than pain, transcend pain, as you rest in the vast expanse of pure emptiness that you deeply and truly are. So what do I see? If I contract as ego, it appears that I am confined in the body, which is confined in the house, which is confined in the large universe around it. But if I rest as the witness, the vast, open, empty consciousness, it becomes obvious that I am not in the body. The body is in me. I am not in this house. The house is in me. I am not in the universe. The universe is in me. All of them are arising in the vast, open, empty, pure, luminous space of primordial consciousness, right now and right now and forever right now. Therefore, be consciousness. I love it. I love that. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Ryan. This has been fun, man. I love it. Yeah. It's been great. Happy to be doing this again and looking forward to hearing from folks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we want to do a whole new year season of Inhabit. So if there's anything you guys in the integral audience. Yeah want us to talk about or want to talk about with us, please let us know yes. and we will uh, prepare some future episodes. Looking forward to it. In the it. meantime, dude, it's good to be back in the saddle, man. Great to be back with you, buddy. Yeah, brother. And just to remind people one more time, uh, Integral Dharma, you can get the standalone course mm -hmm. right now. Yep. We've getting amazing feedback for it. Yeah, yeah I'd love to really, see really you great, and practice great with you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Ryan, I love you so much, man. Love you, buddy.